Welcome to MCCS monthly Lunch and Learn webinar series. My name is Paul Anderson. I'm the executive director for the Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries. Um, the MCCF's mission is to help sustain commercial fisheries, seafood sector, and the communities that depend on them in Eastern Maine and beyond. We conduct programs in collaborative research, collaborative management, collaborative education. Uh, at MCCF, we work with fishermen, partners, and other stakeholders to sustainably manage our fisheries, our coastal ecosystems, and coastal economies. And we recognize that the challenges we all face in that world are, are many and interrelated. Popular parlance nowadays is to call them wicked problems. If you add to these wicked problems the many stressors of change happening around us, in the natural system, it becomes even more complex. And this change that we're observing, trying to understand gets couched within the concept of climate change. I assume that's why you're here, because you're aware of that and interested in that. That's manifesting itself here in Maine's coast and many of the world's coastal oceans with increasing water temperatures, changing ocean chemistry, sea level rise, and uh, many other effects related to meteorology and so forth. Um, our society in responding to these changes through efforts either to mitigate the drivers of climate change or to find ways of adapting to these new changes. And as with all human societal cha challenges, there are varying levels of certainty and a wide range of opinions about how to respond. At present, it seems we're improving on our technologies for observing and monitoring and modeling these changes but what we as a society do with that information is really yet to be seen. Today, we have invited a panel of young adults who are aware of the situation they're inheriting. Uh, I'm asking them to share their concerns, their hopes and fears about climate change and its impact on Maine's fisheries and coasts. I wanna thank Parker Gassett, who you see here on the screen from the Maine Sea Grant Program at the University of Maine for agreeing to moderate this discussion. There's not gonna be any presentations. Uh, it's not intended to identify the solutions to the problems we face, but I wanted to give these young thought leaders the opportunity to have the floor and talk from their hearts, their minds, and their experiences. And certainly as time permits during the next hour, we'll, we'll take your questions. We'd like you to type them into the Q&A function at the bottom or the chat function, and I'll be managing that with Parker later in the program. Um, I've got it pinned, the, the view to a gallery view for you. And if yours is not a gallery view, you might want to choose that because the way we're going to run, Parker will run this is really as a, a, as a discussion. And so you're going to want to see everybody as they're interacting with one another. I hope you enjoy the program and I'm a pleasure to hand it over to Parker and make introductions. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, I, I feel so so fortunate to moderate today's panel with Hallie Arno, Riley Eaton, and Elijah Bryce. And these are early, these are early career professionals. They are entrepreneurs, they are researchers, they're community leaders charting a path for their peers, and also participating in initiatives that are both local and far beyond that in scale. And Hallie, Riley, and Elijah, they're students continuing their education through Maine institutions, but they're, they're also visionaries in the sense that they, you know, their perspectives that they'll share today are uniquely their own, but also representative of, of their generation. And that's a generation that is truly living with climate change as a new normal, all the implications of that reality. So I, I wanna thank the three of you enormously for offering your time today and sharing with us the voices, insight and participation of young people in the reality of climate change is essential and so very valuable, needless to say. So I'd, I'd like to start today off with a quote and then I'll pass the first question over to Hallie Arno. So the quote is from a, a recent book that was published, which is called All We Can Save. It's an amazing document from an all-female authorship of climate pioneers and champions. And one of the things they say is that 
it's not really about putting climate change higher on our priority list. It's about recognizing that climate change affects what are already our most important priorities. And those two things are different. And so Hallie, I wanted to start off with you by asking that question about your priorities. And Hallie, you're, you're a member of Maine Youth for Climate Justice. You are a researcher at the Hurricane Island Center for Science and Leadership. You're currently working with the Midcoast Conservancy and the Maine Environmental Education Association. You, you harvest seaweed uh, out of Goldsboro, just a wealth of experience. So would you introduce yourself and share about you know, what are your priorities and how does climate change affect us? Yeah, thanks Parker and thanks for having me here. I'm really excited to be able to talk to you all. Um, I think that is a really big question of what my priorities are, but I know something that really um, drives the, the work I've done so far has been related to ocean conservation for both ecosystems and fisheries. Um, so making sure that we will have a stable ecosystem and strong fisheries um, both now, but also as the climate changes and the ocean warms, um, and as those, we see those other changes, ensuring that we will still be able to enjoy the ocean and use its resources. And when you say the a stable ecosystem and thriving fisheries, you know, bring that back to home for us. You know, who are the people that you're interacting with that have led to that passion for you? Yeah, so I live in Mid Coast, Maine. Personal connection growing up and going to the beach and being able to do that and wanting everyone to be able to do that and to or and being able to learn how to be on boats and get those experiences and find little creatures in the sand or um, we harvest kelp um, and seeing it come back year after year. Um, and just the, yeah, I think on that personal level, but also I sometimes think a lot about the more global level of the role of the ocean and carbon cycles and the importance of um, carbon sequestration in the ocean and how it drives global um, climates. So both a very personal level from childhood, but also a global level. Thanks, Hallie. Yeah, I mean, you you hit on you hit on some of the science behind this issue and how exciting it is to be diving deeper into those topics, and then brought it back right to home about the lived experience of time on boats and time at the water and knowing that those ecosystems are being taken care of. And really appreciate those insights. I think we're going to dive into those topics a lot more throughout today's session. But I want to ask a similar question to Riley. Riley, you, you have worked with MCCF before. You're a data analyst with them. You hold a commercial lobster license. Uh, you've been involved with a lot of activities around the lobster fishery and wind energy. And, uh, and you're soon to be studying engineering at Bates. I mean, <laughs> awesome portfolio. So excited to be able to talk with you. You know, what, how do you feel about your 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 path through life and your interests and what you care about and how does that at times relate to climate change? Um, so even though I'm planning on going off to college and studying engineering, um, I feel like my life is going to end up bringing me back here. And I mean, I've been born and raised on Deer Isle and I think I'll probably end up coming right back here um, to continue I mean, I've been fishing since I was little, whether it be just going out on the boat or lobstering or scalloping or you name it, I've been a part of it. Um, and so I really think my life is going to bring me full circle and bring me back to doing these kinds of things. Um, but it scares me because the way things have been moving, I mean, just in the short time I've been alive, um, there might not be these industries left for me to come back to. Um, 
And I mean, if I ever have children, they might not be able to experience the amazing things I've been able to experience in my childhood. And so that's, that's a very scary thing. God, I'm just, you know, hitting home about your young people and already thinking down the road at that, the generational reality of wanting to share our lived experience with so many others and a concern that that might not be an option. That's, that's huge. So for your, you know, as you, you, you said that you're headed to, to study engineering and you also have just this diversity of other experiences. How has that kind of interacted with the goal that you just shared around, you know, fisheries being a central part of your lifestyle? Um, so I think that eventually I would like to become a mechanical engineer. Um, so that could lead me to exponential job opportunities that I can find just about anywhere. Um, so that means that I'm designing engines or building engines. Like I could do so many different things that can tie back into the local community in the fishing industry. Um, and I mean, with, I mean, I could even be a part of the, the windmills that they're trying to be building and suggest a better location other than the Gulf of Maine. And then I, I think we'll, we'll talk specifically about the role of technology and, and climate change a little later on, but just so curious, um, you know, you kind of mentioned or alluded to some elements of transition in the fishery and you're also pursuing uh, some credentials that, you know, allow you to be one of those innovators in a space that is in transition. How does that feel? Um, it feels empowering um, to know that I could someday be a part of making these changes to create a more sustainable way of energy or way of life is very, it's very empowering. Totally awesome. Thank you. And to shift to Elijah Bryce, uh, boldly taking a Zoom call over a phone, a level of confidence that I've never jumped into, so impressed uh, by that, but more importantly, by so many other things. You are, you're involved with the lobster fishery. Uh, you, you have a seaweed aquaculture farm. You're you know, exploring and an entrepreneur in these spaces. You're working with muscle aquaculture with DEI, as I understand. The Down East, um, and, uh, Down East Institute. And you're also a boat builder, um, you know, life immersed on the water, uh, but also plans to attend Maine Maritime Academy and, and perhaps pursuits in totally new directions. So, you know, yeah. what, it, what is it that, uh, what is your trajectory, the things you care about, and is climate change related? Well, yeah, I definitely think Climate change is definitely related. Um, I love life on the water. It's always been a big part of my life ever since I was a child. Um, before age 10, I spent a lot of my life down in the Barrier Islands and the Jersey Shore. And I mean, up in Maine, you've got such a rocky coastline. I mean, sometimes you can see the um, effects of sea level rise, but just in, in the beaches, beaches of uh, this, you know, the sand, everything's sand down there, you can see the shoreline receding. It's going away. I mean, these places that are, you know, coastal um, lines with sand they are they're headed out of there they're gonna leave um and definitely as i've grown up i mean i took a lot on in high school i uh it's very motivated i still am um, i've gotten into a lot of things like you're saying aquaculture boat building lobstering i got my lobster license uh it's made me see that i really need to diversify um, myself and definitely look at all options because i have a lot of friends in the in esport, and a lot of them just don't want to look at the fact that lobster may go away or lobster may become a smaller part of our life. And a lot of the older generations, they uh, have been doing the same thing year after year. I mean, they have a system, and that's great, you know. Um, but we have to look at other options, and um, and that's definitely what I'm I'm doing. So, I mean, tell us the list of options that you're already exploring is so exciting. So tell us a little bit more about what you're up to. Um, well, I just finished a new lobster boat last year. I built in my shop. I rebuilt the thing. It's a 32 foot boat. 
um, that took up most of my 2020. I took 2020 and I was pretty much like, well, I, I don't know what the lobster season is going to be like. I don't know what the industry is going to be like the market. Things are looking pretty bad. So I was pretty much like, I'm, I'm going to push myself. I'm going to build this boat. I'm going to upgrade my asset. I was fishing out of a 20 foot East border, a very small skiff and, it was okay with 150 traps, but I upgraded my license and I was soon up, you know, this year I'm at a 500. So that's pretty much like I've, I've got to find a, a larger boat to operate out of just for safety. Cause we have extreme tides up here in Eastport. I actually almost flipped my 20 footer, um, in 2019. And it just really, that stuck with me. I was like, I, I have to find something safer. Um, so I spent most of 2020 doing that, but I also, um, starting in about 2018, I got into boat building with Butch Harris. Um, I build East Porters. I revitalized part of that line, building 17, 21, and 24 foot boats. And uh, I, I enjoy doing it. My great grandfather did it um, in the Jersey Shore, building wooden boats. So I definitely enjoy it. Um, but I don't know if it's something I want to do for my entire life. Um, in 2020, I also got my 100 ton captain's license because I am very interested in the merchant marine um, industry but I wasn't really sure if I wanted to take a loan out to go to Maine Maritime, especially with you know, all the uncertainty. They weren't sure if they're going to do cruises um, due to COVID. So I decided to hold off on that for right now. Um, but I've still been working within my limits of what I can do right now in order to attain my goals. And uh, yeah, and the muscle project, um, I, the, I've been working with the Down East Institute for a couple of years doing test lines. I have uh, several LPA sites in Cops Cook Bay. And uh, this past year, they decided that they wanted to put on a 20, 20, 20 by 20 muscle raft, 20 foot by 20 foot raft. And um, we're starting that right now. We just put the rafts out and we're just doing a feasibility study to see how mussels are growing down East Maine. The water's a little bit colder, so we may have, um, you know, longer growth times till marketable size. But uh, so far, things are looking great. The test lines I did the past couple of years in 2019 and 2018 really showed some great growth. So we're looking, we're hoping that that's going to be pretty successful. Nice. I want to follow on kind of this theme that you, you just, you earlier identified around, you know, Jersey Shore, you're seeing the sand line, the sand bank retreat, you're seeing changes. Yeah. Um, and to ask a, a question to the, to the whole panel, go one by one is, you know, what, what changes have you seen? And I'll, I'll premise this by saying, you know, uh, public audiences, have started to see a lot of these graphs of global temperature change. And we're getting a little familiar with, with what some of those data look like, but in reality, there's so many different types of observations that can be made. So my question to you is, what have you seen either in environmental changes or also in social changes, the ways people are talking about this issue or, or planning for it? What kind of observations have you, have you made? And, and Hallie, if it's okay, we'll go back to you. What have you seen? Or we might have a little connection issue. If you want to try just the audio section, Hallie, go for it. Margaret, she just um, let me know that she's going to try to move her herself and get her into a better signal. So she'll be back. Thanks, Hallie. Riley, would you want to jump in? Sure. Um, so I guess I'll speak more to the social part of it. Um, I feel like climate change, like speaking about it has become more of like a polarizing issue. Like, um, it's like, you're either on one side of it or the other. There's not, people are more polarized on it. It's not so much of a general topic anymore, I guess. Um, along with like, along with that comes more opportunities to speak to the change um like like this opportunity um with a lot of like-minded people so those have been good opportunities to come from it um but then you always get on the other side of the spectrum you get people who don't believe in climate change and don't want to take any steps to be a part of the change and and what's the what's the take home? I mean, where is that where is that coming from? What's the what's the concern or the dilemma that might be motivating some of those perspectives? You know, if we empathize 
with all the people involved in the dialogue, you know, where are they coming from? Um, I think a lot of it comes from, uh, like Elijah had said, uh, people have, some people have grown up in the fishing industry their whole lives and are, are set in their ways and don't want to, I think it's more because they're scared of losing, um, losing what they've known their whole lives more so than not wanting to believe in climate change. It's more so being afraid, realizing what they could lose. Elijah, yeah, you want to pick up on that? Well, no, I, I agree with Riley. That's a, that's a hard reality to uh, look at and accept. And I mean, I, I definitely think uh, a lot of it is, you know, people are in a, people are in a comfort zone. They're used to um, what they've been having for years and years over the generations. And we do need to accept that there are changes and things are going to happen. And uh, we need to figure out how to remediate things and um, find better ways of doing what we want to do without causing effects that are going to mess it up for generations and generations and even our children, you know, I mean, we can't, fix things enough for our children to even probably live the same way that we have lived, um, you know, in my generation, but we can at least do our best to slow it down. Thank you. And Hallie, totally impressed. A commute in the midst of a panel discussion, remarkable resilience, even in this moment. Um, we've been talking about observations that you've made, either environmental shifts that you've kind of witnessed over the years, or even social changes, dynamics that you're kind of using as the data points to think about these trends, both are, you know, both geological and, and, and chemical, maybe. I know you've done some work on ocean acidification in the past, but, um, but other aspects too, from a community perspective as well. Yeah, definitely. And I completely agree with what Elijah and Riley just said. Um, and I think in terms of physical changes, sea level rise is something that we're seeing a lot of now, um, especially in Camden, um, Harbor Park, uh, if anybody has been there, tends to flood a lot more than it has even six years ago when I started high school there. Um, but I also really want to touch on those social changes that Riley and Elijah talked about. I'd like to hope that um, we're seeing a lot more acceptance that climate change is happening in um, the news and just the general population. Um, but I also think in some places I've seen a shift from climate change is happening and we need to do something about it to more of a climate justice angle where climate change is happening and we need to do something about it. And the, our solutions really need to center the needs of the people who are impacted most. And oftentimes those are the people who have contributed least. Um, so I think there has been a bit of a shift from looking at climate change as more than just a carbon problem, but also a social and political problem. And that is encouraging and hopefully it keeps going along. Yeah, let's explore that a little bit more. So. In, in these ideas of transition, you know, from one perspective, we're thinking of this as a very technical issue to fix a, air, a atmospheric chemistry problem and to solve some of the other consequences. But you know, you've just mentioned that once you pull that string, you realize that it's connected to a big bundle of other social, political, cultural issues. So as we think about transition, both the barriers and the opportunities around change, you know, how are you thinking about transition? Um, when I think of that, I think more of maybe like a lifestyle change, not necessarily a change, but we can have the technology to make the changes. But if people themselves don't want to make the change, everything's just going to go back to the way it was before. There won't be long lasting changes. Others. The broad concept of, of transition. You know, what does transition look like right now? 
I think transition is really messy right now. I mean, um, there's, there's all kinds of issues within the industry and just, just I'm in my own Harbor, on my own docks, you know, you, 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 I could not have a conversation about this in my home port. You know, um, you'd be frowned upon. People think you're crazy and people look down on you for it. This is not something that I would feel comfortable talking about as a young person, even among my peers. So I, I, I mean, it's, it's great. I think we need to start talking more, especially as youth and to try and figure out how we can present this in a way that it's not going to scare people that have been in a comfort zone with, um, the industries that they're in and how we can effectively communicate um, because this is a serious issue and there are going to be extreme ramifications. Um, even if we do things to remediate them, it, there's still going to be things that happen, um, but it's how we handle them best that will change the future for generations to come. So, so where, where do we have these conversations? Elijah, you just said like, on your own dock, I might not bring it up. And yet here we are yeah. through a panel webinar with, with, you know, tons of folks on the call and, you know, we're talking pretty freely and openly about this. So where are the places where the conversation is possible? You know, Hallie, what's, what's your thought? Where are these conversations happening? Yeah, I think I have not had the same experience that Elijah's talking about being in mid coast Maine, um, especially at like Camden, Rockland, Belfast area. I think um, there's a lot more openness to talk about climate change. Um, and there are a lot of youth spaces to talk about climate change, like Maine Youth for Climate Justice um, that I'm involved in. We talk a lot about a just transition to a livable future and what that looks like. Um, and the idea that a lot of the people that are most affected by climate change, um, what comes to mind are people that work in the fishing and warming so quickly, um, might also be affected by the proposed solutions to climate change, like wind turbines is something that I know we talked about a fair bit. Um, and how do we make sure that that transition is fair and just, and that the people who are already shouldering so much of the burden by, of climate change and already feeling the effects most are not the people that are going to be affected or be harmed by the solutions. And that's, yeah, that's a really difficult question. Riley, what are your thoughts? Where, where can these conversations take place? Um, so as like Elijah was saying about how he couldn't have these conversations on his dock, I think that those are some of the most important places that these conversations need to happen because <clears throat> I mean, just talking with you guys, I mean, we, we all know what's, what's going on. And I mean, it's not like I have to change your mind about what's happening. It's more so the people who aren't attending this, who's who needs to hear what we have to say. So I think a lot of the outreach needs to happen to people who, who are on those docks and don't want to hear it, but are the people that really do need to hear it. So what is your, what's your perspective on, you know, it, it seems like that's a very delicate ask for a lot of people. You know, there's a lot of nuances involved in that in, you know, what's your insight or guidance to others about, you know, how do you bring up some of these challenging topics, bring in new voices, new perspectives, while also really, you know, dignifying the person that you're working with, who might be coming at this issue from a very different place. And even from a previous comment, there was a mention of like, there's some fear around change is not going to be good for me. And therefore, I don't want to talk about it. So, you know, how do we do that in a way that's empathizing and, and really like bringing people in instead of an alternative? I mean, it could be as simple as starting, just, just start small, like, let's not throw garbage in the ocean. Like, if you have yeah. a pot buoy that's, that gets cut off, just throw it on your boat and bring it in and throw it on the garbage can in the, on the pier. 
I mean, yeah. even if it just starts small like that, it's still going to be a small change in the right direction. Uh, that definitely drives me nuts in some of the boats that I've worked on, you know, you know, I, I collect all my trash. I collect all my trash wherever I go. Um, and like, you know, I'll be working with guys that are having snacks and they'll just toss over the bags. I'm like, why, why are you doing that? Um, and I think a frightening perspective that a lot of pe people have, especially, you know, anywhere, um, this isn't even directed directly towards the commercial fishing industry. This is anyone um, in our society. A lot of people see the reality and they just feel that they can't do anything about it or perhaps they don't care to do anything about it um and therefore they're going to continue their own life and they're going to just take advantage of what they can while they're alive and they're going to live their life out um, it's very self-centered and selfish it doesn't really think about following generations um, and younger people um, but especially with a lot of the a lot of the older guys um, that i know they're just they're just doing what they've always done and they're not going to change. And it's, it's not affecting them right now. So they're just going to do what they want to do to continue their life. And I understand that. Um, but it's, it's a very sensitive topic. Howie. I want to go back to something Riley said a little while ago about climate change being a really polarizing topic. Um, and in terms of starting conversations, I think sometimes the words climate change can be really difficult for people. So saying things like, have you seen the species shifting? Or um, with sea level rise, have you, did you see the really high tide a few days ago? And making it about really more specific events is a good way to open that conversation. And it, you know, bringing it down into that, that local experience that like, did you see this? Did this happen? Did you toss the lunch bag over the boat? You know, making it at the individual scale is, is something that keeps coming up uh, across your, across the comments that you're sharing. And, and a theme that's related is this idea of like, you know, how do you behave and notice things if you think of a place as being your own home, you know, one that you presumably take some care of versus uh, something that like, I can't change that. That's way bigger than me. That's outside of me. And, you know, that, that sense of some of those values are kind of at the core of the, the concept of stewardship. So, you know, what does it take to have some, some perspective of stewardship that most people have in certain aspects of their life, how do we build that to also incorporate climate change as one of those things that we possibly are stewards of? You know, we're managing this, we're taking care of this, we're taking care of it. It's kind of an unspecific question, but Elijah, what's your thought on, on stewardship as it relates to climate change? Well, I think it's, uh, it all is on individual um, responsibilities, um, even literally just starting with not throwing your trash overboard, um, not letting your boat idle for longer than it needs to, or really anything um, more efficient choices with uh, fuel usage. And um, I, I think something I'm interested in is perhaps kelp biofuel for diesel. Um, I think that's a potential reality that we could switch off of and perhaps even electric motors for marine propulsion um, that may work. Um, and personally within myself, um, that, you know, kelp farming that absorbs carbon through the water um, and offsets carbon with the seaweed. And simultaneously, it also um, decreases ocean acidification in nearby waters for shellfish aquaculture. So for myself, I mean, um, I definitely feel good with the aquaculture that I do. Um, and it also, you know, it, the, the kelp helps the environment and uh, kelp also helps the mussels grow into a more um, better product. And that's something I would like to progress on. You know, I, as I get older, I mean, obviously I'm going to spend some time away at school for Maine Maritime at some point. Um, but I see my life transitioning farther away from commercial fishing um, into 
um, working part-time merchant marine or running a charter boat business with my charter boat um, or doing more aquaculture. And I see commercial fishing becoming, you know, still part of my life, but I think it's going to grow into a smaller portion. And So let's, let's run with this because, you know, it started off with the idea of, you know, what does stewardship look like for climate change? But quickly, Elijah, you just jumped into the, the relationship between innovation, between businesses and, you know, creative new ways to have new economies, new equipment, new technology. Um, to think of those, those innovations as part of our stewardship model for climate change is really fascinating. And, and Riley, you mentioned earlier, like studying engineering, I, I might be involved in, in building some of the new generation engines for these boats. And I might be involved in working on the engineering details of wind turbines, wherever they may be. And so, you know, let, let's coast on this for a little bit. What's the role of, of innovation, of business entrepreneurship that can also be really good for tackling this big issue of climate change? What do you think? Riley, you want to kick us off? Sure. Um, so I think that if if everybody has, or if people have this mindset when, like the the innovative mindset when they go into a problem, um, you have you, there's a lot more opportunity to find solutions to the, those problems. Um, so it might not just be taking the first solution that you find. Find, it's working to find the best solution to the problem. Hallie. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think um, research has a really big role in that. Um, I think we've all talked about that um, and trying to find better solutions um, that, and I think, yeah. Uh, so we've all sort of identified that the world is changing and Going back to one of your earlier questions about um, stewardship and responsibility, something that's a little bit frustrating is that most of the warming that's happening in the Gulf of Maine is not from emissions in Maine. Um, so this is a global problem. And on some level, we can't here, we can't do all that much to fix that, but we need to do our part as individuals like Elijah just said, and also we need to adapt to it. And I think that's where a lot of the research and technology will come in. So how can we still have a coastal economy with changing species um, and figuring out how we can continue to um, work and live and enjoy the water? And Elijah, a chance to response? You kind of kicked off this topic, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like I covered what I had to say. Um, I, like Haley was saying, um, it is more of a global issue, definitely with uh, the water warming being from um, reasons other than Maine, but we can still spearhead education on the problem. Um, Maine is known to be a very pristine place, and we, we, we may be able to use that in order to promote preserving areas that are pristine like this and cleaning up areas that are not as pristine from old ways. Um, in order to make them nicer again. Um, and uh, I, I think there's still a lot of opportunity for us to uh, help the issues. I would love to see Maine become a leader, both in terms of developing technology, but also legislation um, and setting an example for the rest of the world, because we are going to be so affected by climate change. But if we can set an example for the rest of the world to follow, we could be a big part of the solution. Nice. I'm, I'm really eager to ask like this big question of, of what, what gives you hope, but I want to just put a pause on that for a moment and, and just respect that like each of you is coming in with really unique independent perspectives on this and sincerely, what are your like big concerns right now? You personally, what are the red flags that really matter to you? Sometimes Sometimes these are a little bit more controversial. And so to be open about that, like for you, what is the big concern right now? Uh, 
I mean, I'm I'm a commercial fisherman and I'm I'm very concerned that this is not going to be a sustainable industry. Um, so I'm concerned that I mean I've put in years of hours to get this license and I'm afraid that maybe that is not going to be of of worth of value. Um, so maybe I'll have to find a new industry to be a part of. Um, so even even though one industry might be looking down, I mean, like Elijah mentioned, the kelp industry, that might be there. When one door closes, you'll have another one open to put to become a part of. So even though it's even though that's a scary thought, um, there's always something new that I could pursue. Thank you. Yeah, I've always been interested in having multiple options for my life and career. Um, so I've really been just spending as much time as I can diversifying what I have as options, credentials, opportunities, businesses that I've tried to start and um, have continued with. Uh, um, so I, I guess my biggest fear is just not, um, not being able to be okay with what I've started. Um, but I have put pressure on myself to continue to diversify myself and look at different options. So, I mean, I feel okay. You know, I mean, like, I know that like, I, I will still be able to love the water and enjoy the water, but I, I guess uh, just a concern is just, you know, definitely what Riley said. Um, I also don't know if this lobster industry will be here. Um, and in order to um, keep up with, requirements that may be needed in order to continue the fishery the feasibility and and just the potential of making any money within it uh, making a livelihood may start to diminish as well um, and those are other issues um, but those are those are concerns that i have thank you Allie, did you want to jump in? Sorry, I'm having it. A... Yeah, yeah, I think in terms of concerns, I have many for climate change. I mean, everything from the worldwide, um, if, the, if there's too much CO2 in the atmosphere and it's too warm, we'd have a really huge ecological crisis and biodiversity loss. Um, and that will really affect people and sea level rise and storms and all of that, all of those terrible things. Um, but on a more personal level, I think something that I am concerned about is similar to the other and how uh, we opened is my children and future generations not being able to enjoy Maine the same way I have. And that's really sad. Um, but I know we're all working really hard to make that not happen. I can agree with Haley on that. That's definitely another concern of mine. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it's, it's, it, it is magnetic to be positive and optimistic around this topic. I think each of you have experienced that because you are change makers in your community is your leaders in your communities, but like giving space for that, you know, this is the sobering, scary part of this reality. Um, you know, it's important and it's courageous to bring it up. So thank you. You know, definitely being young, it's, it is very easy, especially with uh, when you have things going on and you're motivated and working on goals, it's, it's very easy to be stuck in the moment and that's okay. Um, but it is a very humbling and sobering reality for me when I think about the fact that if I have a child or in the future, this may not be a reality for them to enjoy the things that I've enjoyed. Um, and that is scary. That's really scary. So what does give you hope? What are the, the small or large elements that make you feel like, hey, we can do this? Um, well, for me, it's things like this that give me hope. And um, I mean, like recently, 
recently I've started working on a project with an organization for um, reusing plastics and turning it into um, large sheets of like plastic OBS um, to then turn into like furniture, mill it out into furniture. So um, like, like a can buoy or vents or all of that can be shredded, reused and turned into something new that is that's usable in different places, not only the fishing industry. That's like great. Creativity. A lot of aspects to, to give hope. Wow. You wanna share a couple more? Elijah, you wanna hop in? Um, well, I mean, there's, there are options to ride the, ride the wave of change. So, I mean, I feel okay with that. And I mean, part of it is just letting go of the fact that things may not be the same, um, 10, 15, 20 years from now, even five from now, um, just accepting the change and being okay with that and being at peace with it helps me. Um, I think a couple of things that I am hopeful about. Um, one is all the, the research that's being done and like everyone has just said, um, things like aquaculture and ecosystem restoration are working and that's really exciting. Um, and also on the policy side, I've seen some questions in the chat and Q&A about this. Um, we just had a lot of really exciting bills in the legislature for environmental laws um, like uh, divesting from fossil fuels um, just passed and a lot of other really, really exciting things that are giving me hope that we are tackling this problem head on and making headway. So Paul, if you've been monitoring the chat and there are a couple particular questions that you'd wanna Post the panel. So feel welcome to jump in and uh, and select a couple of those. Um, you know, as, as we're nearing the end of this session, I I just want to offer praise and acknowledgement to you all. Like the the wisdom and the insight that you're sharing is amazing. You are you are obviously participating in this dialogue about climate change and the action on climate change. And you know, for you to be as fully empowered as you know, and as willing to go in that direction as you choose, you certainly have all the tools you need already to be leaders in that space. And, you know, just as things have popped up, even from this audience alone about saying, what a remarkable panel, like that's, that stuff is real, really impressive work that you're doing. And, you know, you know, share your voice, speak your truth about these topics. And thank you. Thank you, so, Paul, do you want to? Yeah, for sure. Sure. Let me see if I can get myself back in here. This is wonderful, you guys. This has just been amazing to hear your thoughts and your, your feedback. We have a lot of uh, questions that have come in and a lot of the chat. Perhaps you've been able to monitor some of that yourselves. And thanks to the attendees for your patience on all of this. We're not going to get to all the questions, obviously. This is obviously a very important issue. And many of you have some great insights and thoughts for the, the panelists. Uh, a couple of them kind of um, are asking you all, what's inspired you to, 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 to be where you are right now in your head and your heart around this issue? You know, were there scholars or teachers or others in your life that inspired you to, um, to be paying attention the way you are so well? Uh, for me, it really comes from other young people. Um, I feel like that's more inspiring to me than probably just about anything else to do in this um, topic of discussion. Hearing other young people be um, enthusiastic and wanting to participate in the change is very inspiring for me. I completely Second. agree. Um, oh, sorry, do you want to? You can go ahead. Um, thanks. Yeah, just wanted to agree with Riley that other young people who are fighting for um, climate change and climate justice 
have been a huge inspiration. Um, but I've also been really lucky that I've been able to be part of some great organizations that are helping to um, helping support those young people. I know um, some folks from Hurricane Island and Watershed School are on the call right now. I definitely want to say thank you to them because that's been huge for me. I can now agree with uh, both of you on uh, um, youth being also motivated on these issues and being an inspiration. Um, and definitely, you know, Maine is such a beautiful, pristine place. It's really easy to see the effects of pollution and just trash lying around. It's such a clean environment. Um, I moved from the Jersey Shore uh, a decade ago, and I was born in Los Angeles, California. And, um, you know, I've, I've lived in some urban environments and having moved here, I mean, I've always loved um, the environment and uh, the outdoors and even when i was a child i mean we lived in, on a barrier island so it's still a very nice place and very clean place but still even so having moved here it's, it's so drastic how clean this place is and i'm motivated to keep it that way um, and also make places that aren't as clean as it is great there's a couple of questions that have um, taken kind of the policy angle. And Hallie, you, you mentioned a moment ago some of what's going on in our own legislature here in Maine this year. And as you point out, that's encouraging. There are certainly needs along the similar lines in nationally and even across the globe. What do you, are any of you involved in that part of advocacy policy as part of like perhaps the youth climate action group that you, you have been part of, Hallie, or, or, and then the other question related to that is how can your generation and, and you know, help our legislature along with these conversations? Yeah, I think it's so important to have youth voices in the legislature and it's so easy to call your rep. So I really encourage everybody to do that. Um, call your senators, call your representatives, go, to Augusta if you can and lobby. Um, and there have been a lot of really great bills this session, um, also some really harmful ones that need to be pushed back against. And I think in this legislature particularly, youth voices are valued. Um, so it's a really great opportunity that we have to be involved. Anyone else? I'd add that, you know, at one, at a certain level, when we think of policy, we'll often envision these spaces and a Capitol building and legislative bodies. But that idea of, you know, how are we deciding policy or how are we governing these issues, that happens across scales. You know, that does happen down at the dock. That does happen, you know, at the organization where you're working for them for a summer and you chime in a couple of times and, you know, redirect the conversation. So when we think of, uh, you know, what is your participation in, in public policy, uh, Riley or Elijah, you know, other perspectives on what that role is kind of as a, as a civic participant in this issue? I agree with you. It's definitely going to be down on a level at the dock. Um, I'm crazy busy with all that I'm doing. So it's sometimes hard. Like I said earlier, it's hard to uh, get out of the moment sometimes and really um, find time to participate at a more political level. Um, but it's something that I would see myself being interested in doing and value the importance of it. Uh, one more from the um, q and A. I I guess I'll squeeze in here and then you can try to close things as we get close to the end of the hour, Parker. Um, Phoebe, our friend from Hurricane Island, is asking if you each were had a project in your own community and $100,000 to spend on it, what would you do? Um, I would start by... Um, recycling at the local dumps. Um, there's like none of that available. Um, it's basically just cardboard. And I think that if people had the opportunity to recycle, it would, I mean, I would 
recycle so much more than I do if there was places for me to go with that. Anyone else? I think $100,000 would go really far in terms of climate change education um, and trying to find a way to bring that to both schools, but also adults, um, things like, yeah, uh, more public education initiatives to get people not just to understand what climate change is and how it's happening, but to care about it, which I guess is harder. I'd perhaps be interested in trying to do some research and feasibility studies on biofuel being used in boats. Great, great ideas. Um, thank you all. Parker, I'm going to hand it back to you. Thank you so much, Parker, for moderating today. Parker Gassett with the Maine Sea Grant Program. And I thank all of our three panelists very much. I look forward to seeing you around the communities. And uh, Parker, you want to See if you can close. Yeah, it, it, it seems on my clock that we've got two minutes. So I want to just tweak the last question from Phoebe a little bit more. So Phoebe offered this you know, thought exercise around what would you do with 100K to advance some of these topics? But beyond or including you know, that idea of some money for some work, what do you need in order to keep thriving as you are now and also to lift up and elevate those people around you who you think you know are 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 like-minded in some sense, or like willing to take that courageous step towards commercializing their innovative ideas that are also helpful for climate change, or spreading the awareness, or participating at the state legislature. What do you all need in just a you know one sentence response to go around, starting with Riley? Mm -hmm. It's kind of a tough question. I think as long as people continue talking and being engaged um, and having things like this, then, and speaking to other youth that believe in this, I think that that will keep me going. I mean, just hearing all of the different perspectives that these two had today is really brought in my ideas. Hallie. Yeah, I agree. I think we need to keep the conversation going, um, keep the research happening, keep pushing the legislature because we're making progress and I hope we can continue to make progress. Yeah, I agree with both of you. Um, definitely trying to inspire more youth um, around my age and people younger. Um, and maybe even starting with people that are, you know, pre-K, kids that are very, very young, minds that really haven't taken in the, a wealth of knowledge from the world yet and trying to inspire that within young people. Um, and just, I'd like to just continue doing what I'm doing and hopefully I keep uh, connecting with people along the way. Thank you all. Uh, incredible insight and wisdom and thank you for all the work that you're doing. And Paul, special thanks to the Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries for putting on this great event. Absolutely, Parker. This is really uh, inspired. Let me just put this up for the for the attendees to know how they can reach us at Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries. Here's a little bit of our contact information. Thank you to Riley Eaton, Elijah Bryce, and Haley Arnold, and Parker for uh, for a wonderful hour. Very inspiring. Uh, I found a, a lot of uh, um, great wisdom, a lot of community um, empathy, and and local um, enthusiasm and a, a certain sense of hope. And I think that's really important. Um, for, attend, for attendees, we do this every month. Our Lunch and Learn will happen again at the end of July. A very similar topic um, on ocean acidification. We are blessed at MCCF to have uh, Dr. Libby Jewett on our board of directors and, and Libby manages the ocean acidification research program for NOAA out of Washington, DC. And she will be hosting a panel of scientists talking about 
ocean acidification and how it's affecting um, the local coast here in the Gulf of Maine. So join us for that on July 30th, if that interests you. And we will be doing these every month uh, through the remainder of the summer and into the fall. Thanks, please uh, visit us if you're in Stonington. We do have our facility somewhat open, call in advance, and we'd love to accommodate you and uh, continue this conversation in any way we can. Have a great afternoon.